Hello and welcome. I'm Beatrice Bijon, co-director of the Menzies Australia Institute at King's College London. Each year at the Menzies, we reflect on Anzac Day, the 25th of April, which in Australia is a day of remembrance, not only for the Gallipoli campaign that started in 1915, but also for the First World War as a whole. We acknowledge the lives lost, the lives affected throughout the world by the conflict. For 2021, the Menzies Institute has commissioned a very special conversation between two distinguished historians. We are doing that in partnership with the School of History and the Australian Studies Institute at the Australian National University, or ANU. Professor Bruce Cates teaches at ANU in Canberra. He's talking to Jay Winter, the Charles J. Steele Emeritus Professor at Yale. He's talking today from Paris. Professors Skates and Winter have spent their careers trying to understand the Great War and how it has been remembered. I won't even start listing the books, papers, documentaries racked up by two speakers, nor the awards. You can look them up online. Today's conversation is a journey through landscapes of loss inspired by the war. The commemorations, the memorials, the cemeteries. We will also see how the war was depicted in archives and museums. So again, a very warm welcome and thank you to Bruce Gates and Jay Winter for sharing their deep insights for this Anzac Day reflection. Hello and a warm welcome to the Australian National University's Anzac Day broadcast for 2021. I'm Bruce Skates and it's my great privilege to be hosting today's conversation with my friend and my colleague, Professor Jay Winter. Welcome again to the conversation, Jay, and thank you again for joining us from Paris. This Anzac Day, Jay and I are going to take you on a journey. It's a journey across time and across space. We'll be exploring together the cemeteries, the memory sites, the memorials and the ritual that shape remembrance of the Great War. And I think there is no better scholar than Jay Winter to explain that complex and ever-shifting symbolism. We begin, of course, with acknowledgement. The Australian National University stands on what always was and always will be Aboriginal country. I speak to you today from Ngunnawal Ngambri land, but this broadcast traverses the sovereign territory of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the length and breadth of this great continent. On Anzac Day, we are asked to remember the cost of war, and so we should. But we also do well to remember the undeclared war that was fought here on this soil. May I also take this opportunity of acknowledging you, each and every one of you, and in particular, our ANU alumni, both in Australia and all across the globe. A very special welcome to our guests from the UK and our much valued colleagues at the Menzies Australia Institute in King's College, London. Welcome all. The men and women you can see in this slide are observing Anzac Day at London's Cenotaph almost a century ago. Their offering that you can see there is a spray of Australian wildflowers frozen in a great block of ice and shipped all the way from Sydney. And I think it's timely to remember that these same individuals lived through the pandemic of 1919. And in that year too, despite all the difficulties, Anzac was commemorated, both in Australia and overseas. So really, wherever you are, and in whatever circumstances you find yourself in, we send you a message of support and fellowship in this very difficult time. Anzac Day, of course, uh, was originally marking the tragic landings on the Gallipoli Peninsula in 1915, and so it's appropriate that we begin there. Here you've got two quite different images of Anzac, but both relate to the very first theme I'd like to talk to you about today, Jay, the creation of what you have called landscapes of loss. The bottom image you can see there shows you the fashioning of one of the very first cemeteries at Gallipoli in, in Trapnell Valley. Temporary white crosses are cascading there down the hillside, as Bill Gemmage put it, like white caps seen on the sea. 
and above it, above it's an image of Ari Banu Cemetery today, not far from the place where the original landings were made. Jay, it was my great pleasure to walk across Anzac with you in 2015, and what struck us both then was the immense physical and emotional labour that went into the creation of these cemeteries. So can you tell us more about the fastening of this landscape of loss? Was the memorialization of the war dead on this scale unprecedented? What did the creators of those cemeteries hope to achieve? Well, thank you, Bruce, uh, for inviting me to join you on this uh, virtual pilgrimage uh, to these sites of memory. Um, the first moment of uh, reflection uh, I had um, there in Gallipoli and now in looking at the lower image um, is the fact that uh, the landscape of battle is chaotic and to a degree disordered. It's very difficult to follow, uh, even when we know that the enemy is on the top of the hills and the men below have landed on the coast and want to scale those hills. It's very, very difficult to plot uh, the trajectory of, uh, of battle and therefore of loss. Um, I try to tell my, my students every time we look at a military map that whenever you see an arrow pointing somewhere, don't believe it. Uh, because soldiers move in almost every direction except in straight lines. Um, now, in, in the uh, above image of the cemetery near the landing at Anzac uh, Cove, I think what we see are, are, are three important things about um, commemorative spaces. Uh, the first is they introduce order uh, out of disorder. Uh, they are um, linear rather than chaotic. Um, and give the sense of, uh, of orderly passing uh, to war, which is anything but that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of it uh, that's uh, extraordinary is uh, the extent to which these cemeteries uh, are not uh, constructed by the state. They're constructed by a, what we would now call uh, an NGO. Uh, the Imperial War Graves Commission, which is, which is not a British or Australian institution, uh, but a transnational one. Mm. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, it provides a very unusual um, and original uh, set of solutions to the problem of commemorating soldiers who die in war. The reason why it had to be original is because the British Empire was not Christian. It was multi religious in character, 500,000 Indian soldiers, and India was, still is, one of the largest Muslim countries in the world. Uh, so the, the notion of, uh, of commemorating um, loss through cemeteries um, uh, provides an aesthetic ordering and, and what I would call a transnational political ordering of, of the task. The third thing that, that I see here, uh, which I think is very unusual in this part of your um, uh, tour, and that is that in the First World War, uh, the um, cemeteries on Anzac, on Gallipoli, Anzac Cove, um, are in what was enemy territory. Uh, almost all, not all, but almost all of the Imperial, now Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries are in allied territory because the Western Front and the Italian Fronts are uh, are heavily, were heavily populated uh, by soldiers uh, from um, British and Dominion's uh, forces, uh, but um, Turkey's different. Turkey was defeated. Uh, and by the time it, uh, it, it came to constructing uh, war cemeteries in Turkey, um, the issue of um, honoring those who die became tied up in the issue of Turkish sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the, the cemetery uh, uh, on Gallipoli that we see here, and we'll see some others later, are really unusual um, in the, what I would call, ar archipelago of loss that's scattered across the globe under the aegis of the then Imperial and now Commonwealth War Graves Commission. We might look now at the archipelago loss of loss from the from the very summits. Uh, e each grave on Gallipoli stands, as you've said, as a kind of memorial to an individual soldier from whatever part of the empire they may have come from. 
And of course, we must not forget the Turkish dead entombed in that landscape as well. But there are monuments to the collective dead as well. Um, the memorial of the miss to the missing at Lone Pine is probably the slide, the image that most Australian viewers will be familiar with. But I thought we should also remember the NZ in Anzac today and focus on New Zealand's memorial to the missing as well. And you can see it there, an artist's impression of the monument that Hearst Seeger proposed for the very summit of Chanak Bear. Now, Jay, you've written a great deal about the sightings of monuments like this and the very heavy symbolism that they carry. What function did these memorials to the missing perform and why did they shape, take the particular shape that they did? One answer to the question why they took the shape that they did is uh, to escape from Christian notation. Um, the um, cenotaph is an example, we'll talk about it later, but, but the other sense of this is if you look at the <coughs> Chanak Bear Memorial, it's a truncated obelisk, uh, which is Egyptian in origin. Uh, it is also, and it was very, very attractive for local war memorials because it's the cheapest way of rending stone. Uh, and uh, cost-conscious uh, councilmen all over the world uh, were minded to do the best with the money that they had, uh, which was frequently limited uh, to that which is provided by volunteers. You know, literally the overwhelming uh, expenditure on war memorials all over the world is voluntary, not state and character. Uh, here, what I think uh, we should also note is the second fundamental feature of original um, symbolism in the war memorials of the First World War, uh, which is that half of those who died in the First World War have no known graves. And this is uh, a radical break with a uh, previous uh, tradition. The reason for it is artillery. Uh, we, we know that uh, the um, terrifying battles uh, in Gallipoli in 1915 uh, were dwarfed by the size and scale of artillery later on in the war, but it was bad enough. Mm -hmm. It was bad enough in exposed positions as we saw in Shrapnel Valley where men uh, carrying uh, maybe uh, 40 kilos on their back, it could be as much as that, uh, would be going uphill without cover um, and um, in uh, high noon, uh, as we both know, in in uh, in Turkey in the Mediterranean is is punishing under a punishing sun, punishing artillery. Uh, I still find it astonishing that they were able to go up uphill. So with all that artillery, and with the fact that the landing turned into the equivalent of uh, either stalemate or trench warfare, whichever you want to talk about, whichever way you want to call it, probably both. Um, it was inevitable that men who are buried in temporary graves um, had the additional uh, ignominy of having their resting places disturbed or destroyed by artillery shelling after they were first buried in, in the temporary sites. Uh, and when they were moved down to other perhaps less uh, exposed areas, the same thing would happen. Um, the chaos uh, of uh, burying soldiers in the midst of battle explains why so many soldiers have no known graves and why there's so much confusion about uh, who is in which particular grave. So the, what, I, what I see in Chanak Bear is a um, monument to the missing, which is the stark reality of the First World War, that the, the bodies aren't there to mm -hmm. mourn. Uh, and it is not a Christian monument. And my third point, my last point, which I think is fundamental for virtually all of the ones that uh, we all see, it's not triumphalist. And there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first is they didn't get there. The this interesting thing about the, the battle for Chanak Bear is they got close, very close, as it happens, probably closer than we, um, we acknowledge that the, it, was a, it was a near thing. But at the same time, they didn't get there. And as a result of that, Gallipoli must be understood as a, as a defeat. Uh, hence, this monument is to the missing uh, in a strenuous and almost superhuman effort that failed. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, in my view, that, that is a, an extraordinary point. The monuments to failed battles are much less numerous than the mon monuments uh, to victorious ones. Uh, and it raises, I suppose, the fundamental issue of the whole uh, enterprise, um, that the business of commemorating the men who died in the First World War is 
summarized, I think, in a simple question. How do you, how do you uh, glorify and honor those who die in war without glorifying war itself? Hmm. And the Chanak Bear Memorial, in its simplicity, uh, in its gravity, literally the heaviness of it, um, precludes um, any what I would call um, romanticization of combat uh, or a glorification of war. It's interesting too, isn't it, that, that her Seegers Memorial is designed to capture light from every conceivable angle to, to shine out on the landscape like that. We might look a little bit more closely at, at um, China Bear if we can. Uh, one of the points you've made about monuments in that great pioneering study of yours is that they're places where people can mourn and most important of all, be seen to mourn. The image we're looking at now comes from a scrapbook, a, a scrapbook that's kept by a pilgrim to Gallipoli in 1925. This is a, a rare archival deposit held now in the Australian War Memorial. Ina Marshall is the person involved in taking those photographs. She attended uh, the memorial service at Chanuk Bear, and she was accompanied by grieving parents, by former soldiers, and also by a, a sprinkling of tourists as well. What do you think those images are telling us, Jay, about those early journeys to Gallipoli? That they seem to me to be straddling an enormous emotional spectrum. Well, one thing to say is that the um, the photograph, in particular, the one on the bottom right, is heavily feminine. It's I can't really tell, uh, do a head count, but my guess is majority of women, hmm. uh, and I think that that reflects two fundamental features of pilgrimage. One is that since the time of uh, Egyptian culture, uh, the role of uh, women in mourning practices has been very prominent. So the first thing I see is a re reiteration of, uh, I won't say timeless, but a very old tradition. In the tombs in Luxor, you'll see uh, mourners painted on the roof of the, uh, in the Valley of the Queens, where the mourners have tears painted on their cheeks. That's what women did who were professional mourners. And I remember there, we, we needn't go that far. Uh, think of uh, Stabat Mata, the Christian image that uh, she was there that day. All of the uh, uh, rendering of, of mourning as a, a space in which uh, women have a central place, certainly not the only place, but a central place is, is here. The second uh, point is that pilgrimage is, um, is something which um, expresses an impossible quest. Um, and that's because it engages in a symbolic exchange. The, the men gave their lives. What can we give in return? And one answer is effort. We can get on, on a boat in Sydney and then go down to Melbourne and then go across to the West Coast and then wind up somewhere, maybe in India, and then finally in the Suez Canal. Maybe then we would wind up in Italy or in Marseille and then take a, a, a train. This is effort, effort uh, and cost. Uh, it is costly emotionally, it's costly physically, it's cost, costly um, in every sense. Uh, but no matter what we give, it's never enough. Mm. It can't be a discharge of debt, only a reiteration of debt. Uh, and that's what I think happens here, that people want to uh, tread the, uh, the landscape of loss uh, to feel something about the last moments of their loved ones. If they can come closer to the experience of their loved ones, then their sense of indebtedness might be less uh, heavy to bear. The other point about uh, pilgrimage that's really extraordinary is that once it's over, there's a kind of emotional release uh, in which, and this, is, this has been true since the time of Chaucer, uh, there, there can be um, drinking, uh, enjoyment, uh, return to life. There is a rite de passage after um, pilgrimage. And I think um, uh, Australians would have had a good deal of time to as it were, decompress emotionally after the heightened moment of going to Gallipoli or elsewhere um, on the way back. It's a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, and going home, they could perhaps begin to understand uh, the sense of, uh, uh, of uh, the need, not only to remember, but to go back to life again and start living. Uh, 
Mm. Until pilgrimage is achieved, if you will, uh, life has a question in it. Have I done enough? But after it's achieved, as many Muslims know in the Hajj, there is a sense of relief and release and perhaps of, if I, if I could use the term, uh, of peace that yeah. might come along with it. It mm. may not happen. I don't say that for a moment. Mourning is a mystery that poets understand better than historians. Uh, but the, the act of pilgrimage, which happens in every society I know anything about, has a structure of going up the mountain and then going down the mountain. And what yeah. these images show is precisely those stages. Yes, and, and going up that mountain, um, one of the women refused to join that cart and decided to walk that landscape instead, precisely so that she could experience something of that ordeal. Um, focusing again on, on monuments for a moment longer, I mean, they are great structures set in stone, but there's nothing permanent really about them, is there, in the sense that they're reshaped, they're reinterpreted, they're, they're challenged by successive generations too. Now, the two images that we're looking at now um, suggest the way that commemoration is contested at Gallipoli. The Turks place that gigantic statue of Ataturk, uh, as again Bill Gamage put it, aggressively close to the New Zealand Memorial. And it's Ataturk, of course, who drove New Zealand and British and Indian troops from the summit and who dashed, as you said, any, any hope at all of ever winning that campaign. Not that there was ever any hope, I think, of winning that campaign. In the immediate aftermath of Anzac, though, what, what we see, though, is the Treaty of Lausanne. And, and there you see is a, another battle being waged for possession of Gallipoli's landscape. And I know you've been working on this subject for some time now. The map you can see there locates the, the Anzac area that was actually ceded to the Empire as part of the Treaty of Lausanne. Why were the Allies so intent, Jay, on actually possessing Gallipoli like that? What are the geopolitical realities of commemoration that we're dealing with here? Well, there, there are two entirely, um, I would say, contradictory elements in the Allied search for possession of the land. The first is they lost. This is, this is a symbolic rerun of the landing, only this time with the capacity, legal capacity, to take uh, ownership of the land. Um, the other uh, part of this, which I think is, is um, much more in the domain of lawyers uh, than of historians, um, you use the word seated. Uh, I think that actually is a tenuous uh -huh. legal position since the compromise uh, was that uh, the land is eternally Turkish, mm -hmm. but the, as it were, the soil and the graves and the bodies of the Australian soldiers who died there have been given in perpetuity to their country. So one way of looking at this is, and, and indeed Ataturk himself liked to use these metaphors, uh, is that uh, the, the, the area of commemoration becomes sacred soil for in, in, in and of Australia. It becomes part of the nation that sent these people. But at the same time, the uh, rock under which <laughs> the, these cemeteries uh, have been placed is Turkish. Mm. Uh, and it was very important for the Turks to perform sovereignty at the Treaty of Lausanne, which ended the last treaty that ended the war. Uh, and their, their, what I would call orneriness, their, their touchiness about it being Turkish uh, land uh, is a, a function of the racial contempt uh, imperial Orientalism with which they were treated uh, as, you know, small brown men from a non-civilized part of the world. Uh, the Allies supported the Greeks to the hilt, but the um, Turks, in fact, the, the nice phrase that I think Lord Curzon, Foreign Secretary, likes, likes you, he always talked about the Turk. Mm. And you know, as well as I do, Bruce, that sometimes a turn of phrase can disclose a turn of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was contempt, there still is to a degree, uh, for Muslim, um, uh, not quite white, not quite brown <laughs> uh, Turks who caused trouble uh, and um, difficulty for Western powers. We, we know this. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, I think what's, what's, what's very important is that the um, new Turkish regime 
uh, which Mustafa Kemal uh, brought into being. He only became Ataturk later. His uh, statue is of Mustafa Kemal, then uh, later on the father of his people. But the, the, the critical point is that these are people who arose from defeat in 1918, total defeat, uh, to refashion a republic, not an empire, but a republic in Turkey uh, that commanded the respect of the world. And this um, statue is the man who commanded that respect. So what he's menacing is, I don't think it's Anzac, he's, he's menacing the, the condescension of the European and uh, white settler parts of the world coming to look at these inferior people. Uh, who managed somehow to stop the uh, noble troops of Anzac and the British and the and the French and the others from uh, from taking the Gallipoli Peninsula? Uh, that's a mystery um, in many respects, uh, but it is an astonishing achievement uh, that, as it were, pre provided a preview of the even greater achievement uh, of Phoenix-like rising of Turkey from the ashes of defeat into victory in 1923 when the, when the, uh, when the treaty was uh, uh, signed uh, in Lausanne. Um, no other country that lost the, the war was, was able to do this. Only Turkey was. And it, it is, of course, not uh, enough to say that they were guilty of atrocious crimes in the course of the First World War. The Armenian Genocide was a state act. But the, the government that rose after the end of the war was not the government that ordered the Armenian genocide, although some of the individuals lasted throughout the transition. Uh, what we see uh, here in that slide on the left uh, is a political leader who pulled off uh, one of the magical turns of political history in the 20th century. How do you conjure victory out of total defeat? Uh, Mustafa Kemal did it. As with so much of your work, Jay, this will have a collaborative dimension, won't it? You're working with a Turkish scholar, I believe, to, to put this perspective. Yes, and one, one of the important points to realise um, is that the Turkish side of the story is almost always left out uh, or, in, uh, or treated as a, as a, as a sidelight. Um, but the Turkish commemoration uh, of uh, Gallipoli has become a major political issue, uh, especially in the hands of the current uh, uh, leader of Turkey, Erdogan, who has turned it into, by and large, a, a, a narrative supporting his political movement and its Muslim character, which is something that Mustafa Kemal did not believe in. He wanted to westernize and, and secularize uh, Turkey. He succeeded in uh, not only overthrowing the Sultan, which was shall we say, necessary to get rid of the imperial uh, baggage of the past, but he also got rid of the caliphate uh, mm -hmm. so that the sultan, who no longer existed, could not cede place to a caliph who, who, who sat in Constantinople, now Istanbul, and uh, was a, a, a figure of great importance of Islam. He, uh, Mustafa Kemal did, did a lot of uh, radical uh, revision of uh, Turkish politics and the commemorative forms that we see in Turkey to him all over the place, I think are not misplaced. He, he was a giant. And I think that's, that statue says it. Well, we could linger longer uh, in Turkey as indeed we lingered there in, in 2015. But I want to turn away now from those foreign fields and look at memorial culture a bit more closely in Australia, Jay, if I can. And how fortunate we are to have that monumental work by Ken Inglis to guide us. Some um, sacred places remains, doesn't it? The most ambitious and most revealing study of war memorials in the Australian landscape and arguably anywhere in the world. Now, as Ken uh, noted, memorials take a myriad different forms and they reflect the hopes and the aspirations of the many communities that raise them. I thought we might begin with these two examples. Um, one, as you can see, is a, a broken column which was raised to mark men in southeast Gippsland who marched to war and did not march home again. And then a cross of sacrifice which was placed in the very centre of the Women's Memorial Garden in Adelaide. Now, now both these memorials are, are, are employing a careful and evocative symbolism which arguably, I think, reveals the purpose of every memorial. Um, what, what can you tell us about them, Jay? What, what function are they performing there? Well, the first um, striking feature of these 
um, memorials, uh, they're, they're linked with uh, civil society and not the state. These are voluntary organizations, groups of people, friends, neighbors, uh, relatives uh, who do this from below. This is not what the great German historian George Mossy sees the imposition of a narrative of war, the myth of war experience on ordinary people. It's the opposite. It's the construction of a narrative that is independent of the state and frequently basically not answering to any other group than the local. The local is what matters. Uh, the second thing that's critical uh, is the, uh, the issue of naming. Uh, we can see the names on the image on the left. Uh, I presume, although I don't know, but I, I presume a pretty good uh, likelihood that it's the two Mackey brothers who didn't come back. Mm. Uh, in other words, what's critical is to recognize families here. These are not only residents of a particular area or school or, uh, uh, or parish, uh, but they're, they're brothers, quite literally brothers. And uh, all over the world, you can see this, um, where the, the more rural you get, uh, the more terrifying are the list of three or four names that are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really quite astonishing. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to see. Uh, I happen to be in the, uh, the large um, synagogue of La Victoire in Paris, um, on this weekend for a memorial service uh, and pass the uh, monument to Jewish soldiers who died in the First World War there. And again, it's of the, of the parish, as it were, of, the, of that part of uh, Paris. And there are 58 Levies. Uh, what, what do you do? This is it's the same problem with the Joneses in, uh, mm. uh, in, uh, in Wales. Um, it's not possible to uh, say that the people with the same name are of the same family, but we have a pretty good um, we can make a pretty good bet uh, that what we see is the terrifying effect of the First World War in taking more than one son from a family. Uh, and this happened, by the way, to the great and the good as much as it did to the anonymous. Uh, but the, the family names are also important because of the originality. And I, I think uh, uh, our colleague Tom Lacour has written on this uh, movingly. The names are what matters. The names are what matters. Uh, and that's why rank doesn't matter, why the date of death doesn't matter, uh, and why um, proximity, as it were, to, uh, uh, to those who pay the money don't, don't matter. They don't put the people who are in their family first or whatever. There is a unity, a mm, what I would call an equality in death in the image on the left, which is quite stunning. The second, uh, uh, I think, very strong image, and I felt this very much in seeing this memorial in Adelaide on, on many occasions, is the extent to which uh, war memorials move back in time to um, older notations uh, to provide a sense of meaning. And those notations can be classical, they can be religious, uh, they can be uh, romantic, uh, and when they're romantic, frequently they're medieval. Uh, and the cross of sacrifice, which we can see in the Adelaide Memorial on the right, is not the Latin cross of crucifixion. It's a medieval cross of chivalry. Uh, and this is one, one very important point, because after all, uh, the, the cross can be mistaken for a Christian cross, but it isn't. Uh, it is uh, a presence of the medieval when individual knights fought with each other in a war in which death is anonymous and in which bodies don't survive. They get literally blown to dust, to nothingness. Uh, so the return to older languages of meaning um, help distance the survivors from the terrifying modernity of war. Mm. The, the reaffirmation of the old is a way of taking some of the terror of the new away from those who have lost loved ones in the course of combat. And it's interesting, too, that that is uh, a replica of the cross of sacrifice that marks war graves all across the world. And, and of course, the women of Adelaide were consciously trying to, to recreate a graveyard in their, in their memorial. Uh, the, the plots are actually aligned as if they were graves, plots of flowers circling that great memorial. Uh, and the other thing they did, Jay, um, they couldn't, of course, name all of the men of Adelaide on that memorial. But, but what they did, again, it's that surrogate funeral idea of, of burying 
the names on paper in the foundation stone itself. And and reading about that, I was struck by Catherine Moriarty's phrase of making the absent present again, bringing those names, those bodies in a way back to life. And that might be the point at which we turn and look at those figurative memorials that are, are dotted across the Australian landscape. The Stone Soldier, um, as Ken Inglis noticed, it's, it's probably the most iconic of Australia's war memorials, even if it's not the most common. And of course, Jay tells us that it's the exception rather than the rule, those figurative memorials for all kinds of reasons. For now, Joe, Jay, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about those figurative memorials. And here I've offered you no fewer than three examples. A stone soldier uh, raised in the country town of Benalla. Rainer Hoff's sculpture, Sacrifice, that stands at the centre of Sydney's uh, State Memorial in Hyde Park. And finally, Paul Montford's classical frieze that's perched up there on the on the roof line of Melbourne Shrine. You, you might want to comment on a couple or focus on one of those. And I was wondering, too, if you could see how you respond to Annette Becker's claim that these figurative memorials can sometimes sanitise the, the violence of war, neutralise it in a way. Well, what, what we can see there is, um, in each of the three cases, uh, totally intact bodies. Uh, and the problem with artillery is that it does anything other than leave bodies intact. Uh, the, the concept of putting, as it were, the family together, uh, I believe, is symbolized here by putting the body together, back together, uh, and seeing those who uh, die in war as having in a bit like Ezekiel in the Bible, uh, their bones come together again, uh, uh, even when they're, um, they're dead, as in the, um, in the image on the right uh, below, uh, there isn't a single wound. Not a, this is, in, in many respects, the sanitization is uh, the return to the Greek uh, beautiful body, the body of the, of the, of the male as intact. Uh, our colleague Joanna Burke wrote a very good book on dismembering the male. This is remembering the male. And I, I use that word deliberately uh, because of its double meaning. Uh, to remember bodies um, is very difficult if they are literally uh, severed into different parts. Mm -hmm. um, even Christ with a hole in his side is an intact human being. Uh, brutally tortured to death, but intact. And that notion of, 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 a, of a body that we can see as beautiful uh, re reinforces the position or argument that I tried to make so long ago uh, about the return to older um, traditions. Uh, these are not modernist sculptures. Uh, there's no Picasso in them. There's not even a bit of Matisse, but there's there's a great deal of a romantic, religious, and classical uh, reference, uh, and, and and in some ways, I, th I think the, the the figure on the on the left uh, embodies a certain kind of romantic tradition uh, that the the soldier is um, not a warrior. He's a, he's a civilian in uniform. Uh, he has a nobility that doesn't come from the bearing of arms but from the bearing of his soul uh, in remembrance of his brothers. There's, there's something very, very powerful about the Australian honor uh, to what I would call the dignity of, um, of soldiers who are in a position of sadness because of the loss of their mates and their friends. Uh, so in a way, the, the allegories on the right, both the Greek allegory uh, of sacrifice above uh, and uh, the Christ-like image uh, below, although changed in order not to establish it as a Christian image, there's a difference between those two on the right and, and the one on the left. And the one on the left I, I see is much more uh, Australian than the, than the ones on the right. Here I do follow in Ken English's footsteps happily uh, because there is uh, uh, there are echoes in other war memorials all over the world, uh, but I think only in Australia and in New Zealand are there um, uh, evident, is there evidence of the reconstruction uh, of, the, of the citizen soldier as dignified because he's not a, sol not a warrior, but a man who, who basically did his job as a citizen uh, to defend his, uh, defend his country. 
we can't see that in the in the images on the on the right. And maybe that leads to another point, uh, Bruce, that you could develop uh, further uh, with your students, and that is the, the in my view the most powerful war memorials are the simplest ones. Mm -hmm. The more ornate, the more complex they get, the harder it is for people to see the simplicity of the message that war destroys human bodies uh, and nothing we can do will bring them back. Well, on that note of simplicity of image, we might turn to probably one of the simplest and yet also in the most complex commemorative form, uh, Edward Lutchen's uh, cenotaph. Um, we've got a couple of images of the cenotaph here today. Um, you can see an image there of uh, the cenotaph as it stands today in Whitehall, centre of London. But that same structure was, of course, faithfully reproduced in many Australian cities and towns, including in Melbourne. Um, a, a cenotaph stood on the steps of Parliament in the 1920s. Today, of course, the focal point of Anzac Day in Melbourne will be the Shrine of Remembrance in the Domain. But that massive memorial wasn't completed until the 1930s. And until then, we had the Cenotaph, a, a plaster and timber reconstruction, faithful reconstruction of Lutchen's memorial. And we directed every April and every Anzac Day in the centre of Melbourne. Now, Jay, you have described the Cenotaph as a work of genius. And uh, many Melburnians in the 1920s would have agreed with you and would have much preferred that as their memorial. Why was the Cenotaph so attractive to that generation? And is it attractive still today? The Cenotaph in, in London is still uh, the memorial uh, heart of, of, uh, of London and maybe of Britain. I think we can say that. Um, it's the people's shrine. The tune of the unknown warrior in uh, Westminster Abbey is the shrine of the kings of England. But the cenotaph is the shrine of the people of England, and they voted with their feet to make it so in 1920. Uh, and I, I think the important point about it is that it, it doesn't say anything other than itself. It is the message. And that message of simplicity is also an empty tomb because of the chaos of war and the weight of artillery and the, I would say, the mess of the battlefields after the war. The images of what they looked like after the war is just horrifying uh, everywhere, for that matter, all over the, the world. Uh, because of that, uh, it was impossible for uh, any government to follow a strict line of bringing the dead bodies home. They couldn't do it. Uh, very difficult in almost every single case. But in the British case, the, the rule was no, they stay where they are. The French case is different. First there was that, and then the state said anyone who wants them to uh, be removed will be, uh, it will be done at the expense of the state in, in 1921, and about a quarter, maybe 30% of, uh, of those who died for France, and that's three, 300,000 bodies were removed, but not for Britain. So when we talk about an empty tomb, we're talking about everybody's experience. Cenotaph is an empty tomb. It's a Greek notation, it's not Christian at all. And it provided, as it were, a statement of what happened to the families of Britain in the course of the First World War. They were given an empty tomb at their home or in their parish or nearby, so that the order uh, of uh, passage in generations was disturbed. The first is it's turned upside down because there's something very unnatural uh, with uh, parents burying their children. Very unnatural. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. It should be the other way around. But the, the other problem that's built into war uh, is there's something unnatural about not having a, bur a body to bury at all because the duty to remember a phrase redolent now all over the world really comes out of family practices. The only duty to remember we all, uh, I think, learn when we're small is uh, our parents and the gift of life that they gave to us. Uh, and the need to, to mark their passing is something that everybody who came to the Cenotaph in uh, 1920 or after would know about, or, or indeed in any, any part of the world. So what happens is that the Cenotaph uh, says something about the revolution in mourning that was forced upon the families of the British Empire and Dominions uh, by the huge effort, an unprecedented effort of, of engaging in, in war. It's, it's, a, it's a monument about a revolution that doesn't say it. The only thing it does say that made Dean 
inge of uh, uh, of uh, Westminster apoplectic is that it's not Christian, mm. it's Greek. And what's more, there's a very important point uh, in that uh, laurel wreath, which is all that it says, and you can see it to this day, is to the glorious dead. And that is really, really annoying to the, not only Christians uh, uh, among uh, those coming to that site, but also to the nationalists who were proud of the army and war and so on. Glory is not in the living, it's only in the dead. And glory is not in the state, and it's not in the empire, it's not in the king, it's in the dead. We need to honor them. In the same way as the old hymn of the American Civil War, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, not of the military, not, not of the generals, not of the kings, but of those who have gone to glory, gone elsewhere. And once you separate war and glory, there is a space for feeling the sheer weight of war that makes it intolerable. And I, I think one thing that I see more and more as I get older in the cenotaph is that it's what I call an embryonic pacifist statue. Um, it is honoring those who die in war without honoring war. And that to me is, is the most important question to answer when you look or to pose when you look at any war memorial. How does it approach? What answer does any war memorial give? That's what you should ask yourself when you stand in front of any one of them. Uh, and they have multiple meanings uh, and will never satisfy everybody. But this one satisfied 2 million people when it was first installed so that Lord Curzon, who was the you know, magician of the British cabinet and knew everybody under the sun, um, went to see Lutyens, his friend, uh, uh, architect, and said, can you do this in two weeks? And he did a design on the back of an envelope. I mean that. It's, it's in the Royal Institute of, of British Architects. You can still see the, the scribble design that he did. And then he did it and put it in plaster of Paris. And the people of Britain voted with their feet to make it the National Memorial. And indeed, the, the war memorial, I think, of the, of the English-speaking world. And that it remains to this day. Indeed, an active genius to able to be able to give voice to loss in that way, and so often that loss, as you said at the very beginning of this conversation, is spoken by women. And on that um, note, I want to turn to the next series of slides. You can see a, a quite a strong contrast here, can't you, Jay? In the first, you've got a woman pinning a, a floral tribute to the gates of the wharves at Woolloomooloo, and that suggests to me the way that those quite utilitarian urban spaces in our cities could actually be appropriated for memorial purposes. It was through those gates, of course, the gates to the wharf, that a generation of men and women sailed off to war and into eternity. And we might contrast that improvised, spontaneous grieving led by women with perhaps Australia's most costly and probably most contrived memorial complex, Victoria's Shrine of Remembrance. What I'd like you to comment on is another theme raised by those images, and that's the, the gendered work of remembrance. In the Woolloomooloo photograph, we see women at the centre of commemorative practice, don't we? Feminising that, that rough masculine space. The image of the shrine, though, no, that's very, very different. This is the, one of the first dawn services, and this was an exclusively male affair. Uh, men gathered, they stood to, awaiting the dawn, and women were instructed to stay away. This was their service. I'm wondering, Jay, if you think we can talk about the gendered contours of commemoration of war and, and whether, in fact, we're actually seeing a shift in the way commemoration changes, that women are again as, assuming that con centrality in the grieving process. Well, one of the things that I think is most important in the, um, in the location of First World War memorials in the landscape of our present lives uh, is to recognise uh, that they carry... Uh, iconic messages, not just historical messages. That, that is to say, they're about war, not just about the first war. Uh, and I think, I think the important point is that war is like COVID. It's a mutant virus. It mutates. It changes. And in the course of the 20th century, it's changed in such a way uh, as to be civilianized. The First World War did have millions of civilian victims, but it was primarily a war fought between armies of great imperial powers and their satellites, uh, their dominions, their colonies, their friends or allies. Uh, in the course of the Second World War, the majority of those who died were, were women. And the further on we get into the 20th century, 
the greater the proportion of civilian deaths in wartime to military it means the greater proportion of women uh, who are the victims of war. Um, it is clear to me that as war changes, so does our sense of the meaning of the war memorials that have been erected earlier in the 20th century. Uh, that image of uh, a male only um, uh, dawn service uh, strikes me as impossible today. Mm, indeed. It's impossible. Uh, and the the notion that uh, war is only about men is is something that has gone the way of all flesh, and it's also partly uh, a function of the fact that now our profession has uh, at least fifty uh, percent, uh, uh, maybe more, of of women historians who are writing about it and and bring uh, perspectives, not only with female perspectives, but bring new perspectives to bear on this issue. So the the community uh, of mourners has changed. Uh, because the war, the longer the 20th century has gone on, the, the, the more f feminized uh, loss of life in wartime has become. And also because uh, we historians have uh, not um, remained in the, uh, shall we say, uh, shallow uh, uh, graves of uh, masculine domain that existed in uh, university life uh, uh, early on. Um, the, you know, the idea that, that Bean was a great historian, I have no contest with. Uh, but um, I think the idea that a woman could have written the history of Anzac was not possible when he did it. Mm. Uh, but today, indeed, uh, John Beaumont is an example. There are many others. Annette Becker, there our leaders are men and women. And the way we look at this um, gendered image um, of women putting flowers, uh, another important um, uh, idea that women are decorative, no longer, I think, can pass muster. Uh, I like giving flowers too. Uh, and it, it isn't something that we can say is, is a feminine thing to do. It, it's, it's a mm. human thing to do. Uh, so the, the 20th century, I think, has shed uh, some of the masculine essentialism that made war the story of boys and their toys. We can't, we can't play that game anymore. Mm. Yes, and I should just make reference there to, to the, how well that image is used by Tanya Lurkins in her book, um, Gates of Memory, capturing women's experience of loss in war brilliantly, I think. Well, now, Jay, if we can, we'll move to the final part of today's discussion. And we're going to be turning back to those commemorative sites overseas. We're not going back to Gallipoli. Um, Gallipoli may loom large in Australia's national imagining of war, but we should always remember, of course, that the Western Front was the most important theatre and certainly claimed the greatest number of lives. What we have here um, are two images of Australia's national memorial at Villers Bretonneux, and they're both featuring another piece of Lutchen's, Lutchen's commanding tower that soars up above that landscape as a commemorative centrepiece. Now the black and white image that we can see is from a souvenir booklet, a booklet that's actually issued by the French rather than the Australian government, just as the memorial is nearing completion in 1938. Uh, of course we finished Villas Better Now just in time for the Second World War. Um, the photograph, by contrast, is how that space is being used today. What we see there is Lutchen's tower providing a, a convenient backdrop, if you like, for those ghostly images of soldiers that were projected right through the night in the lead up to Anzac Day in 2018. In a moment, Jay, um, you might like to consider maybe how the meaning of Anzac Day seems to have shifted away from that solemn contemplative affair we were talking about before that emphasised the irreparable loss of a generation into maybe a much more raucous celebration of nationalism and, and maybe that top-down, state-managed, orchestrated remembrance is, is part of that process. But for now, I am very, very conscious that few of our viewers will have actually visited the new museum at Villers Bretonneux. So what I'm going to do is invite our audience to join us. We're going to go on that long walk down a kind of simulated trench line to the subterranean exhibition spaces of the Sir John Monash Centre. Here you will hear, so the guidebook tells us, the testimony of war from those giant talking figures, and you will experience war on the Western Front. The next show, it says, starts in 30 minutes. Now, Jay, you were one of the historians behind the making of France's great national museum on the Somme, the Historial de la Grande Guerre, and you argued that those who design a war memorial faced what you call a stark choice. What did that choice involve at Villers Bretonne? What did Australia choose to do? Well, the, the stark choice is uh, to 
um, use false images to introduce visitors to real images. Uh, the you know handsome soldier with one hand uh, in a fist and the other holding his his slouch hat is um, an actor, uh, and he is a good actor and presents his words well. Uh, but I, I'm old-fashioned, Bruce. I believe that we historians are in the truth business. We're not in the business of entertainment. And when we we have uh, a, a challenge uh, to provide what is now called in the business infotainment, uh, we wind up doing damage uh, to the uh, historical record. Uh, and to a degree, we wind up trivializing it, turning it into a, a sonnet lumière in French, a show. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's a reason for doing that. They didn't, they did use the term theaters of war for a reason. There is something theatrical about, about the staging of war, but the documents of the time are so rich that the idea that we need to go through uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, show of false representation in order to get to true representation, I think is, is terrible. Uh, it's something that I think is In beyond uh, what we historians uh, can can do, uh, and the more that we stick to the documents and the historical record, the rich historical record that exists, uh, the better it will be. Um, one thing in visiting this center that absolutely astonished me is the idea that in this sacred site, uh, it would be possible to tell the story of the whole war. Now, yes, uh, it is important for people to get a sense of the totality of, of the war. But where you are underground is a place where two things happened uh, in August uh, of 1918 and also in April, coinciding with Anzac Day of 1918, that had very substantial effects on the outcome of the war. Uh, I'm a miniaturist at heart. I think you know, uh, Bruce. I like telling big stories in small spaces and from small objects. Not this center. This center tells big stories from big objects and tries to make the sense of gratitude that we should feel for the men who, who did this um, uh, job. Uh, we should feel it because we are going into a kind of um, Hollywood presentation of the past. Uh, I was saddened to learn as well uh, while there uh, that um, to build the uh, the bus parks around the site, uh, a substantial number, unknown number, but a substantial number of underground tunnels were destroyed. Uh, so for the interests of tourism, mm -hmm. the integrity of the site was compromised. Uh, above all, this is a uh, a, a way of saying that the start choices between history and entertainment. Yes, and an injury to the physical site, but also maybe an injury to that generation. I remember the architects of Villa Bretonneur talking about it being a, a place of a peace and contemplation. And now, of course, um, the Great War, the war to end all wars, still rumbles on beneath the earth. I thought our audience out there might like to have a look at the at the great memorial museum that, that Jay and others uh, put together in France. Um, the exhibitions from the Historial, you can see here, make no attempt at that pseudo-realism, as Jay put it. There's no recreation of dugouts, no battle simulations. Instead, what you do is you invite visitors on a demanding and reflective journey. Um, Jay, you say that you organise the Historial along the lines of what you call a horizontal axis, um, and it's captured, I think, in these images. What what do you mean by that? What were you hoping to achieve? In a in a in a nutshell, what I tried to uh, suggest at the beginning of the design in uh, 1986, 1987, uh, was that um, the horizontal is the language of mourning, the vertical is the language of redemption, and my own view is that the First World War was anything but a redemptive event. The outcome of it was fundamentally to prepare the ground for the next one mm -hmm. uh, and to reorganize the explosive material that had produced the First World War by adding additional explosives that would 
be detonated in 1939. Uh, so it was a bloody waste of over 10 million lives and more. So the issue is how to avoid um, the uh, redemptive narrative of war. And one is to stay away from the vertical. If you notice, most monuments that are what I would call phallic in character, masculine, aggressive, militarist, are vertical. Uh, and what we tried, therefore, to do is, is to change the, uh, I would call it, uh, organization of space within a museum to include the floor. Mm. And it made perfect sense to anyone who read the documents of the First World War because soldiers had to live underground in order to stay alive. So the idea of using the below uh, ground area as part of the story of war made perfect sense. Uh, in addition, it enabled us to do something which uh, everybody uh, realizes, but very few people practice, uh, which is to stop treating war as a national story, but as a transnational story. Mm. Uh, it's about everybody. It's not about one country. And the more we tell uh, the narrative, the story of the First World War as an Australian story, the more we betray the reality of war, which is that it was a global story. Uh, I remember very well, not uh, a pleasing, a uh, distinguished Australian at the launch of the Cambridge history of the First World War, uh, who, who wondered uh, why in the world uh, the great uh, general who um, uh, dominated uh, the, the battles uh, of um, on the Somme in 1918, why he isn't in the book. Uh, Sir John Monash should be right in the center of the story. Um, yes, Monash was a great man. Uh, his story is the story of many, many, many different men in, in different parts of, of the world. And an unusual story it is too, but it's not a national story. And to move beyond that is a very difficult job. Yes, every country should teach its national history to its, its students, to its pupils. And I have no doubt whatsoever about that. But at the same time, the more we live in a globalized world, the more we have to realize uh, is that our national story is not that different from the story of other people when we enter the domain of war. It's a story of brutality. It's a story of loss. It's a story of missed opportunities, of uh, casual judgments fallen on their inventors' heads. It's a story of, of tragedy. And in, in many respects, tragedy is not national. Mm. Uh, it's human. Uh, and th that's why I think in some respects, the move away from the uh, verticality of, uh, of that soldier with his you know, clenched fist, that Australian actor pretending to be an Anzac, uh, the move away from that is the way uh, that the future has to go. And, and I think I have some, some degree of, uh, uh, of optimism about that. Well, we're coming to the close of our discussion now, but I, I thought we'd end with a couple of images that highlight, as you've reminded us, the, the human cost of war that's shared by, by every nation. It's not hardly unique to Australia. This Anzac Day, of course, we've been exhorted, as we are every Anzac Day, to remember the fallen. Their names, as you can see, are gleaming in gold there in the cloisters of the Australian War Memorial. But of course, we have to remember that not all the casualties of war are actually recorded there, not even all the Australian casualties of war. The fatality uh, list cut short in 1921. That's the year when the first AIF is disbanded. What that means, of course, is that legions of men and women who continued to die of war-related causes decades and decades after the guns stopped firing are not remembered. And Alan Ward, of course, is one of them. He occupied the Iron Cot in that second image in one of Australia's repatriation hospitals for 43 years, 43 years in an Iron Cot. His battles certainly didn't end in 1918. So it's to that theme of repatriation, Jay, what happened when the war came home, that I want to end on today. And that's because you were one of the historians who helped to preserve a significant archive of British repatriation records. And as you know, the National Archives here in Australia has begun the long task of digitising an equally rich and complex holding of Australian repatriation records. Now, you've written a great deal about how descendants and others have used these records, such records, to extend their own knowledge of a family's war history. I'm wondering if you think that the release of repatriation records that are telling us quite a different story about war is actually going to change the way war is remembered in Australia, a move towards perhaps a more mature and nuanced remembrance of that conflict. Do you think that, Jay? Yes, I'm, I'm, I, first of all, I want to salute you as one of the central movers of the effort to make sure that these 
sources are digitized and therefore accessible. Um, the important point is that, uh, that the stories of families at war is the central reason why millions of people uh, want to know about it. 1914-18 uh, is the first time that family history and global history crossed fully, were integrated as it were, in, inextricably braided together. And it's never been anything other than that since. So people who want to go online and see something about a relative who fought in the First World War are traversing a century of family history more than of national history. Of course, they're, they're, they're intersecting and they're coterminous. But once you look at family history, you realize, as, as you pointed out, the war doesn't end when the, uh, when the lawyers say that it does, or when the, when the, or even when the soldiers say that it does, it goes on and on and on. And the, the critical thing, I think, to, to realize, too, is how war becomes, um, and loss in war, becomes a way in which families define themselves. Uh, all those photographs on mantelpieces in the interwar years where uh, there's an X over an image of a family photograph or somebody who isn't there, those absent presences or present absences, if you will, uh, they, they were there and they, they remain so. Um, in, in many respects, the, the notion that uh, every family um, had uh, an existence which was defined by who isn't there uh, becomes a very important point to find when we look on digitized, into uh, digitized uh, records. Uh, the, the second reason why I'm, um, uh, I think it's very important that these, these records uh, come together uh, is because they tell the story of injustice. Uh, the, the British files are not called repatriation, they're pension files. Uh, and what they show is the absolute meanness and immorality of pension authorities over decades of handling these cases. I don't say people, these cases, uh, because in the interwar years in particular, they were enjoined to cut expenses, and that meant cutting pensions. Mm -hmm. And what we can see are people struggling and suffering uh, in such a way as to show once more that the state is not the story of benevolence. If benevolence happens, it's because of civil society, not because of the state. And what, what I think further uh, follows from that, which is very important, uh, is the extent to which uh, the failure of the state to provide for uh, for veterans of all kinds, those who are severely wounded or those who are uh, who are not wounded at all. The, the idea of the non-financial recognition of the broken years in, in Bill Gamage's phrase, the lack of recognition meant that that burden had to be taken up by women and children, wives and children. And those children are victimized by the inhuman system of, uh, of uh, pensions allocations and the, mis and the miserable levels at which they were paid and maintained in, in virtually every country I know anything about uh, all over the world. So there, there's, there's something about injustice that's written into the um, records of pensions in, in Britain or in France or in repatriation records uh, that tell us uh, that those who, who fight uh, and, who, and who should be honored for what they did, uh, seeing it in their light, in their lights, they should be honored for what they did, uh, entered into a social contract with a government that let down, uh, didn't fulfill that contract. They did not restore people to the lives that they had before the war. They did not provide them with enough to uh, lead a dignified or uh, indeed a, even a, a passably uh, uh, straightforward uh, and, um, and working life. Uh, much less than that is the truth. And I think one, one point that with my, my friend and colleague Antoine Pro that we try to show in the French case is that the issue of injustice in the treatment of veterans is one of the ways in which the modern human rights movement was born. Because what soldiers wanted at the end of the First World War is, is not charity, but their rights. What it is that they had earned by standing up and joining and taking the King's shilling and so on. Well, they never got it. Injustice is built into the history of repatriation. Uh, and it's something that we need to, to recognize that happens to this day. There would not be a recognition of post-traumatic stress disorder if there were not a sense that the state had let down veterans who suffered from injuries that pension authorities refused to recognize for decades. And this is true in Australia, in New Zealand, as it is true all over the world. Look at the history of war and we see the history of injustice. Uh, repatriation records give us the long durée uh, of that story. 
Yes, that land fit for heroes certainly wasn't the soldier settlement blocks that those men and women received. Well, Jay, I want to thank you for today's rewarding and, and wide-ranging discussion. Um, my students hear your words uh, in every class, and indeed it's been wonderful to journey across this landscape of remembrance with you. What we want to say very loud and clear is how much we're looking forward to receiving you back here at the Australian National University and continuing that great work of collaboration which has opened up so many new horizons in the way that we remember the Great War. We're about to close now. Thank you so much for your company. But as today is Anzac Day, and as it's been so hard this year to gather together around our memorials, we thought we should end now with our own act of remembrance. It's a song written about an unknown soldier whose remains were recovered from one of those mass graves at Fromel. That man carried a train ticket, a good luck charm, because he longed to come home. Remembrance, as Jay just eloquently reminded us, is an attempt to overcome the terrible anonymity of mass death in the Great War. And really, by writing and singing this song, Johnny Cronin reminds us that the men and women we remember today were so much more than just nameless names, etched in bronze or in stone. train ticket in my pocket my tobacco and a photograph of you and when the war is over I will ride that train to you I want to hear you talk softly hear you whisper my name I want to talk to you about the weather So you can tell me if it's gonna rain And I want to walk down Chapman Street and Drink beer at the sail and anchor I want to dance in dead town hall and walk you home past the football oval and I want to hear you talk softly hear you whisper my name I want to talk to you about the weather can tell me if it's gonna rain And I don't care if you say I look older But don't forget who I am Please don't call me soldier Because it's not my Station where my love.